understand that. And then in terms of they just there's no regard for your physical safety or well being at all because it doesn't matter because you're a mean a means to an end. So they need what they need from you and then goodbye. You know, suck it up, tough it up, and we'll see you for the next one. And so that's what I mean by it being sort of morally bankrupt is there's just no empathy or concern for companies benefit hugely from medical emergencies, where a military-industrial okay. complex benefits from war, where an energy companies benefit from energy crises, you are going to Please generate right. states of perpetual crisis. Yes. Where the interests of ordinary people well, yes. separate from the interests of the elite. Hello! Like, it comes at you with authority yep. and certainty and uh, all of these sort of tropes that we've come to, like, and we've seen it all our lives, and it evolves a little bit, they always look more or less the same, the background looks more or less the same, the tone, the pomposity of the music. You forget that this is just a commercial product that's giving yeah. you information that's salient to its own objective. It's a great way to put it, commercial product. It can't tell you, hey, shit, we don't know anything. The only bit of reality we can observe is a minute portion of all potential realities. We've got to radically reevaluate everything. I'm being told stuff by Pfizer back there. Ah, they can't yeah. afford that kind of latitude. They've got to stay on the rail. I was uh, having a conversation with Eric Weinstein the other day where he's explaining to me the, the reality of other dimensions. 
and the, 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 the measurable reality of other dimensions that we absolutely know that they exist and do other beings have access to them? Can they travel through these things? Is that what we're dealing with? Imagine if that becomes at the forefront of the zeitgeist, if people recognize that not only are there other dimensions, multiple other dimensions that are recognizable, measurable, you know where they are, you know how to get to them, but beings are coming from those dimensions and visiting us on a regular basis. You're going to go, holy shit, there's a bigger thing going on. There's something that transcends all physical reality as we know it. When it came to the ceremony itself, Megan said the experience lasted three nights and was, quote, incredibly intense. Everybody's journey is different. The second night, I went to, to hell for eternity. Um, yeah. And to, just knowing eternity is, um, like, t torture in itself because there was no beginning, middle, or end. So you have, like, a real ego death. At night, I went to, to hell for eternity. Um, yeah. And to, just knowing eternity is, um, like, t torture in itself because there was no beginning, middle, or end. So you have, like, a real ego death. It just goes straight into your soul, and it takes you to the psychological prison that you hold yourself in. So it's, it's your own version of hell, and I was definitely there. For me, they don't really care if you drop dead afterwards. It doesn't matter. Do you break, you break an arm, break a leg? And, it, you know, things like when you're working, you can get really sick. As long as you're not bleeding from your face, you're going to keep working, and people don't understand that. And then in terms of they just there's no regard for your physical safety or well-being at all because it doesn't matter because you're a, mean, a means to an end. So they need what they need from you, and then goodbye. You know, suck it up of it up and we'll see you for the next one and so that's what I mean by it being sort of morally bankrupt is there's just no empathy or concern for humanity or god forbid like recognition of a spirit that doesn't in my experience from my perspective I haven't experienced that in, in this industry there's not a lot of concern there are agents that reliably produce religious experiences and no one knows what in the world to do about that that's for sure. Talk about a strange trip. It's mind-blowing. Megan Fox gets candid about drinking ayahuasca with Machine Gun Kelly in Costa Rica. That's hard to top that one, man. The Till Death actress appeared on Monday's Jimmy Kimmel Live with guest host Arsenio Hall and opened up about her quasi-spiritual journey in the Central American wilderness with her boyfriend after drinking the psychoactive tea used in ceremonial rituals as a spiritual medicine, which BTW induces auditory and visual hallucinations. Do you guys know what ayahuasca is? Oh, yes! So we went to we went to Costa Rica to do ayahuasca like in a proper setting like with indigenous people and I was thinking it was like glamping or something like that it's still going to be like a some kind of five star experience and you get there and you really are in the middle of the jungle and you don't get to eat after like 1 p.m. you have to walk a very far distance to get your water you can't shower because they're in a drought nothing glamorous about it it's all a part of sort of making you vulnerable so that you surrender to the experience. You know, and it's certainly the case that, like, I firmly believe that the world is not the way we perceive it. It's deeply, it's deeply strange. And I do believe that the hallucinogens reveal that. Um, there's a narrative aspect to it. There's a religious aspect to it. There's an, a meaningful aspect to it that we don't understand. We can't understand it scientifically or we haven't been able to. The scientific viewpoint excludes that to some degree. And I think the best evidence for that probably does come from hallucinogenic experience. Now, people have, clearly, people have a biologically instantiated religious instinct. Now, it's possible that that only speaks of our peculiar biological nature. That it doesn't reflect broader reality as such. But if you go deep enough into the psyche, what you it becomes increasingly difficult to separate what you discover from reality. Now, it's not. People can clearly have individual subjective religious experiences, 
most scientific phenomena are objective. Many people have to experience the phenomena at the same time. You have these religious experiences that can be induced by hallucinogens, let's say. Each person has their own particular experience, but everyone has an experience that's similar. And we don't know what to do about that category of experience. And then, you know, we think in stories and we see the world through a structure of value. I think that's, I think that that has been proven beyond a doubt by neuroscientists and psychologists. And the fact that we see the world through a prism of value seems to indicate that there's something about value that's real. And so that's partly why things are deeply mysterious. I mean, Rick Strassman, he terrified himself right out of the DMT research, as far as I could tell, because all his subjects came back and said, well, you know, I went somewhere else and saw aliens. It's like, well, it was a dream. No, sorry, wasn't a dream. It was way more real than any dream. In fact, it was actually more real than life. Well, what do you do with that? I mean, it, it's, it's beyond comprehension. Our culture grew out of the Bible. It's grounded in the Bible, for better or worse. And so if you want to know who you are and why you think the way you think, like you think you know the way you think, you think you think, you don't. Or very rarely. Like the thoughts, thoughts are greater than you are in some sense. I mean, it's very rare that you don't think that you think something that someone else hasn't thought. You know, why? I can't remember who said it. it. Might have been Alfred North Whitehead that you know everyone's the unconscious proponent of some philosopher. They don't. You know, everyone is the unconscious proponent of some philosopher. So, anyways, the deepest values are religious, and our religious document is the Bible, and the Bible is an absolute mystery. Um. The deepest questions are religious questions, and the Bible is the best answer we have. And if you don't like that, well, fine, do better. understandably 
the only measurable part of our reality, yeah. while knowing even deeply personally for our own subjectivity that there's something else within us. There is our experience of rational thought, there's our experience of bodily sensation, but there's something else within us. W.B. Yeats, the Irish poet, said each artist must create their own religion, and I feel like in a culture where there is no discipline, religion, ideology, other than your role is to be a passive consumer, to consume information, to consume right. product, to not question, then almost every individual has to have like, right, this is what I believe in, this is who I am, this is how I'm going to make my life. Now, I don't mean this in an individualistic way, because otherwise then you've unconsciously fallen into one of what I believe is the unspoken ideologies of our time, materialism, progressivism, individualism, yes. what you are as an individual is the most important thing, because actually that isn't true, that there's a spiritual deficiency that causes addicts to become addicts. They're looking for something that they can't find in the world. Neural, stop showing me pictures of that giant Jesus statue in Rio being struck by lightning. It's not a sign from God. It's what happens when you leave stuff out in the rain. <laughs> Jesus, not Frankenstein. No matter how many times it gets zapped with electricity, it's not coming back to life. And I live in America where Jesus is already too much of a lightning rod. John, I've not known you long, but I love you already. But I have to say that it's, it's disingenuous to claim that the biases that are exhibited on Fox News are any different from the biases exhibited on MSNBC. It's difficult to suggest that's, that's that these corporations operate as anything other than mouth pieces for their affiliate owners in Black Rock and Vanguard and, and unless we start to embrace and then also mate like just spiritually if I may use that word in your great country we have to take responsibility for our own perspective right. I've been on that MSNBC mate it was propagandist nut crackery you're, you're on there. Do that. I went on a show called Morning Joe it was absurd the way they carried Good morning, on Morning Joe yes. yeah, it was, I don't it. know what it was it wasn't morning there was no one called Joe there no one could concentrate they didn't understand the basic tenets of journalism. No one was willing to stick up for genuine American heroes uh, like Edward Snowden. No one was willing to talk about Julian Assange and what he suffered trying to bring real journalism to the American people. And I think to sit within the castle of MSNBC throwing rocks at Fox News is ludicrous. My friend. Make MSNBC my better. Friend, my Make friend, MSNBC my great friend, again. My friend, I would love... Russell, Russell, darling, um, the moment that you give me a specific example, an actual example... Okay, I'll give you... Oh, just wait, just wait, 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 wait,
cultural differences thing about which propagandist network is the worst is not going to save a single American life, not improve the life of a single American child, not going to improve America's standing in the world, and the world needs a strong America. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you that. So you have an obligation, a duty, not to condemn these people. Superficial charm, grandiosity, and self-importance. A need for constant stimulation, a penchant for lying, deception, and manipulation, and the incapacity for remorse or guilt. It is the misguided belief that wealth, fame, personal style, and personal advancement, mistaken for individualism, are the same as democratic equality. It is the celebration of image over substance. Fame and wealth are their own justification, their own morality. How one gets there is irrelevant. And as we sink into an economic and political morass, as we barrel toward a crisis that will create more misery than the Great Depression, we are controlled, manipulated, and distracted by a society awash in electronic hallucinations and social media. The consumer culture and the cult of the self are not designed simply to entertain. They are designed to drain us emotionally, confuse us about our identity, make us blame ourselves for our predicament, and condition us to choose the illusions of unachievable happiness and keep us from fighting back. I'm interviewed in the film, and I think one of the things I say in the film is that this is what happens with all dying cultures, that this is really about the cult of death. And when I went to divinity school, we were, all, we were taught that idols, the idol worship, begins with the consumption or the sacrifice of others, but always ends by your own sacrifice. Consumption or the sacrifice of others, but always ends by your own sacrifice. Danger of idolatry. And I, th I think that's what this film uh, very powerfully illustrates is that a culture that kneels before these idols slays itself. Yeah, and I also loved your l words about the antidote to the to to this apocalypse because it I I made the film and the book because I felt like we were kind of barreling towards the apocalypse and that this was an unsustainable future. But I loved what you said about how authentic culture can provide us a way to think critically about what's around us, and that's really what. This, my work has been about is having a way to deconstruct the culture around us so we can kind of see the matrix that we're in and hopefully have a little agency over it. Boston-born Lauren Greenfield has been exploring culture through photography and documentaries for more than 30 years. She also directed the HBO documentary Thin, which follows four women with eating disorders working toward recovery, beauty culture, a critical examination of beauty and pop culture, and the Queen of Versailles about the owners of one of the largest and most expensive homes in the country until the crash of 08. In her latest film, Generation Wealth, Greenfield presents a visual history of our growing obsession with money, beauty, sex, and more which Variety calls a compelling argument for a society on the brink of decline. In a way, I started out thinking it was about money or thinking about it was a wealth or the image of that, and what I ended up seeing is you could also plug in the currency of beauty, the currency of youth, the currency of sexuality, the currency of fame, that we were addicted to all of these things that were unattainable and kind of comparing ourselves against ideas that were unattainable, and that just kept us on this hamster wheel. Right below the surface, a kind of collective misery. Yeah, it's almost like we all of the subjects in the film are searching for something that can't fill a kind of emptiness that comes from trauma we kind of learn in the film. And so they're all kind of um, trying to get somewhere that they never get to. In the intro, we played the sound from that guy who said, uh, society's a mass greatest wealth at the moment they face death. Are you, look at the smile on your face. <laughs> are you predicting the collapse of our culture or what are you, are you just uh, issuing a warning? It's kind of a warning because I do think collapse is possible. I mean, I do think we're headed on an unsustainable path. That what you see in the film is that we want more and more, that we're never satisfied, that we can't stop until we crash. And I think that's a dangerous path to be on.
world's first general new gender neutral clothing store has officially opened in New York City. And it's one of the first gender neutral clothing stores in the world. And it's breaking barriers, one piece of clothing at a time. Everything we're doing is breaking a barrier. We're looking at everything and turning it upside down and saying, why is this? Just because it's been this way doesn't mean it should continue to be this way. Breaking the binary. That's the motto that this New York store goes by. We do our very best to ask everybody what their pronoun is. So is it he, him, she, her, Z, Z, they, them? And from there, that makes people feel really comfortable in their shopping experience and knowing that there's going to be no judgment. Now, Rob hopes to open up several more fluid stores around the world, and he hopes to accomplish this within the next five years. What is it that brands do? Are they, are we, I mean, I think that, that people are seeking their identity in brands, that their identity is so eroded. I think that's exactly right, that they're looking to define themselves with these material things. I remember interviewing one teenager, and she said, I'm Kate Spade, and my friend is some other brand. It's almost like this fusion of material things and identity, and in a way, that's why I think it just continues to sow our insecurity, because um, we can't really find ourselves in those ephemeral brands. And this, as the movie as the film makes clear, has has just seeped down to even the inner city, to every layer of American right, well, there's, I mean, yeah. global society. There's what I saw in the culture in L.A. in the 90s and how kids were being affected had kind of spread like a virus right. to everybody. And I think with reality TV, with social media, this is no longer limited to L.A. This is kind of our mode of comparison. Well, it's ubiquitous. So you see that it's really irrational pathology and has nothing to do with the money or the weight or the youth that they're actually trying to get to. One of the things that is uh, kind of constant throughout the film is that no one ever has enough. No matter what they achieve, reminds me of Proust. I don't know if you've read Proust, but you never achieve happiness because as soon as you, you have what you think is happy, um, there's always something glittering out there and, and, it, and, and in fact perpetuates uh, a deep unhappiness. I think that's you know, something you hit several times. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the core of what the movie's about and... and is also kind of the core of capitalism, which shows this insecurity in all of us and then can sell us something to fix that, only to find a new problem. I mean, in the film, one of the things that really struck me was talking to a Wall Street banker who said, everybody in finance has a number. And they say when they get to that number, they're out of the business. And they get to that number, and it's not enough, and they change the number. And that really resonated for me.